everybody, it's Cash. Thank you very much for stopping by. Hello, my darlings. Lovely to see you all. As always, I'm in a mad rush today. Basically, I'm just throwing this thing together. <laughs> and I think it may look like that too. But I've got so much stuff to get through, including Matt Gates, whose life seems to be heading for a brick wall right now. I'll take a look at him. Plus Tucker Carlson. Not quite sure what's going on with Tucker Carlson. He seems to have abandoned American interests completely and now be siding with Russia. Did somebody pay him? Plus the race in Georgia between Raphael Warnock and what is assumed to be the Republican contender, Herschel Walker. He's got Trump's backing and also Mitch McConnell's. So he seems to be uh, very firmly in the running. We'll take a look at him. Plus, I did, <laughs> I did US democracy again, because last time I did it, so many people went, well, that's depressing. And I thought, yeah, you know, it was a bit depressing. So let's look again and see if there's any improvements in US democracy. <laughs> Welcome to the new subscribers. It's never less than delightful to have a whole bunch of new people join us. That's great. To the donors, <laughs> I'm gobsmacked. What can I say? And uh, beyond grateful. Uh, you'll get your little notes. I am writing them gradually. But uh, sincerity takes time, I have to admit. But uh, you'll get them. And thank you, of course, to the commenters. Lots of comments. I didn't get to reply to them all, but I did read them. Somebody complained about the white balance in the videos. You are absolutely right. I know it keeps changing color and going light and dark. That's because apparently I'm way too animated for the video. <laughs> the computer is having a nervous breakdown trying to keep up with my movements. I swap from a camera to a computer and uh, the computer is not up to the job, sadly. So I apologize for that. A lot of people said about orbs in the videos. Yes, there are orbs, but there are way more orbs in the raw footage than you actually get to see on the screen. I have to cut them out because of time and putting pictures in and headlines and stuff. But uh, there are loads of orbs in this room for some particular reason. I'm not quite sure why. Very, very interesting. Somebody else asked, are you able to do pictures for yourself? Uh, I've addressed this several times before. Yes, I am. In fact, it's all I did for about 30 years because nobody, until you came along, was interested at all in my pictures. It's only recently that uh, there's been a kind of focus on them. And I did pictures for myself uh, about two weeks ago. I didn't really understand them. <laughs> I know I'm supposed to, but I didn't. Uh, I was floating above the earth like Superman, only far wimpier. <laughs> and then, as I watched, another planet came up over the horizon. Not the moon, a planet came up over the horizon. And I flew to it and looked back at the Earth, and the Earth trembled like... <laughs> and I just watched it from afar. And I uh, wasn't quite sure what that meant, except that I do do that, really, in what I do. I just kind of watch events. I don't participate in them. I just watch them and map them out and do pictures for them. So maybe it means that. But uh, those are my recent set of pictures for myself. <laughs> and I, I was left completely in the dark about what they mean. Also, thank you to everybody who said such nice things about the transition pictures for Tik Nyat. Han or Tik Nat Han, some people pronounce it. That is now on the Soul Crossings channel, that video, if you want to go and look at it. Somebody said it was too soon, and did I feel comfortable doing it? I didn't do Betty White, I didn't do Meatloaf, I didn't do Bob Saget, I did this guy, Tik Nat Han. God, that's difficult to say, because uh, his pictures were so wonderful and he had such an amazing transition. And also I wouldn't have got pictures had he not given his permission. So I felt very comfortable doing that. These guru guys seem to know something that the rest of us don't. There's a guy called Mayor Baba. He died in 1969. His nickname was The Awakener. He really believed that he was God in mortal form. And of course he was because we all are. But he had this idea that our evolution as souls goes from an unconscious awareness of the divine when we are plankton or, you know, small rodents or something. And then we gradually grow through every single lifetime and evolve 
eventually through human lifetimes, into a conscious awareness of the divine. And once we reach the conscious awareness of the divine, we are at a point of enlightenment and don't need to be reborn. It's sort of Darwinism taken to its extreme. And so I did his pictures out of interest because he had a most horrific car accident and was wheelchair bound and in terrible pain. When he died, he slipped out of his mortal form into formlessness the way you slip a foot out of a shoe or a hand out of a glove. He just slid out of it and went down this shaft and he hit the bottom of the shaft like a big fat raindrop hitting a window ledge and split into lots of little drops that then ran along the ground in rivulets until they came together as one whole body of amorphous water-like substance in the metaphorical cave I always see. And then, as he was standing there in this amorphous shape, a great tide of water, of grace, I assume, flowed down the symbolic tunnel I always see, engulfed him, claimed him, embraced him, and became one with him, because it was water, he was water, and just took him away up the tunnel into the light. So again, he wasn't one of those people who just spouted a whole bunch of ideas or principles or meta-narratives. He lived this, he believed this, he was this thing that he had preached. And Meher Baba, again, seemed to be the real thing, as far as I could tell. As for Olive, uh, yeah, I know I said that Olive is an anagram of evil O, but it's also an anagram of I love. And weirdly and ironically, I hate Olives. This is the only Olive I've ever loved. <laughs> and she's doing absolutely fine. To everybody who said, get her wheatgrass and she'll stop chewing the plants. I have done that and she's eating it. So yes, thank you. That really, really worked. I think I know why her original owner must have thrown her out, because she just eats all the time. And when you're eating, you think, oh, I'm just going to have my meal, olives being fed, no problem. And then you look across and you see her there. Or at other times, she's not there. And so you have your meal and then suddenly you realise, oh, there she is. <laughs> She's always around, just staring at me, waiting for food. And finally, Justice Breyer is retiring from the Supreme Court. Now, this is really, really interesting because, if you remember, I've done pictures for Justice Breyer and I've done pictures for SCOTUS. When I did SCOTUS, if you remember, all the judges were on a raft together in a very choppy sea. It was, oh, it was like really hard to stay on. And either one or two people fell off. And they left a judge in the water and said, well, sorry, we got to go. Bye. And the raft just went away, leaving the judge in the water. Well, send somebody to come and get you. Right? So that might have been Justice Breyer. But when I did Justice Breyer's pictures, he showed no signs of wanting to retire. He was just walking along this open plain, totally happy, loving his life and his work. But the path he was on brought him to a cliff. Didn't matter. He was happy just being there. But then the overhang began to crumble under him. And the more it crumbled, the more unstable it became, and eventually he fell off. So although he was totally happy doing what he was doing, somebody must have taken him to one side and said, look, sunshine, you need to retire now because we do not want another Ruth Bader Ginsburg situation. We do not want the Republicans installing another Amy Coney Barrett. That would be disastrous, so you gotta go. And the ground fell away from beneath his feet and he had to retire. Which is a shame, really, because he was a really, really, really good judge. 
Now, we could end it there, really. Uh, already I'm exhausted. But uh, no, let's continue with Matt Gates. Now, if you remember, the last time I did pictures for Matt Gates, he was standing there and a friend of his said, I'll give you some kind of PR cover so that you'll be fine. We'll confuse issues. We'll put out disinformation. You'll be fine. This whole thing about you and an underage girl, eh, it'll just disappear. We'll obscure it. So the friend, whoever this was, had a kind of fire extinguisher thing that emitted mist. It emitted smoke. And Matt Gates was so relieved. He walked into the smoke and said, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. They'll never find me here. Unfortunately, the smoke or the mist began to clear. And when it got thin enough, what did he see but... Figures in suits, prosecutors, lawyers, whoever this was, and he panicked. He ran behind a wall into a maze of corridors where he was out of the way, and then he found a room, locked himself in it, and just stood there while the prosecutors went by. <sighs> So it did look in those pictures like he might be safe, despite the recent cooperation of his ex-girlfriend, despite the conviction of old friends and stuff, it looked like he might get away with it. So I thought I'd take another look. And when I found him this time, he was in a corridor, but a curved corridor. And the fact that it was curved meant that he couldn't see what was around the turn. And because he couldn't, and because he kind of thinks in the moment and doesn't really engage in considering consequences or whatever, he was just walking along jauntily. He was just like really, really happy. And then at a certain point, he goes, what's that? And it's a bunch of people, a huge crowd of people all heading for him. He doesn't want to talk to them. He doesn't want to find out what they want. He just knows it's not good. They don't look happy. And so he goes, do, 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 I'll go over here. There's a door. He tries to get in the door and it's locked. And by the time he's realized it's locked, the crowd, the gang, the people are down upon him, crowding in. The media maybe, or lawyers or something, but they're crowding him in and he's pressed against the door. Uh, yeah, oh, um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say. And, oh, uh, ooh. and they're accusing him and shouting at him. And eventually the pressure forces the door to collapse inwards. Bam! And he's just going, oh my God, oh, oh. It's a real tidal wave of consuming interest. He wriggles out of it and he runs. Ahead, there's three doors, all locked. Three opportunities for escape that just don't pan out. There's no way of getting through these doors. The only way out is down a ramp. And at the bottom of this ramp, there's just whiteness. Now, whiteness in the pictures usually means something good. And I guess it might. There's a possibility that that's his escape. He just ducks under and disappears and everything is fine for Matt Gates. However, when I went down there, it didn't feel good. It didn't feel like an escape. The whiteness felt like bathing in bleach or hydrochloric acid or something. Like it was stripping away my very being. Now, maybe he has an escape route and it strips away all the accusations and all the damage to his reputation. And he's absolutely fine because he's saying, I didn't know the girl was 17. I'm as shocked as anybody. It's very hard to tell. That probably doesn't count. It's an underage person, a minor. But there's something about going down that ramp that takes the something off him, the skin or the reputation, or the standing, or the money, or something is stripped away in a hydrochloric fashion. And again, like the previous pictures where he hid in the little room, <sighs> it's so hard to tell how this ends. Maybe he is innocent. Maybe nothing happened and he's fine. Or maybe it's just a matter of time before the law catches up with him. We'll see. Also, I did Tucker Carlson. Now, if you remember, when I did Tucker Carlson way back in 2020, 
the pictures showed that once Trump lost the election, he'd be kind of lost. He was wandering down these immensely badly drawn corridors <laughs> and just looking around going, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what narrative I'm going to promote now. Now Trump's gone, uh, it's hard to say. Then the next set of pictures showed him trying to get into a room where people on the inside were dining together and having a good time. He felt like an outcast, like somebody who wasn't welcome. So he moved on on his own, along a gymnast bar. Very tricky walking along this thing, always on a knife edge, but it brought him to a dead end, a wall. And I don't know that we've actually reached that wall yet, but he certainly is a sort of outcast. He's loved by his audience, presumably he's loved by his bosses as well, but he's considered some kind of wacko who's gone off the rails. This must be the narrative that he chose. Support Russia, support the Hungarian dictator, just do things that are extreme and some might say anti-American. This seems to be his narrative now. And of course, Russian television features his reports. They show clips on uh, Russian state television of Tucker Carlson as a Russian friendly American. So I thought I would take a look at him again and see how things were going to go for him from now on. Bear in mind, he's not reached that wall yet, as far as I can tell. That's still unfolding. But when I found him, he was like a drunken sailor. He was wandering through this very intricate mechanism of wheels and cogs and things that were turning, like being on the inside of a Swiss watch. Bear in mind, he doesn't drink anymore. This is not a guy who imbibes alcohol. But in the pictures, he was off his head drunk and he was out of control destroying restraints, guardrails, pa, out of the window. And he ended up in this, I'm going to call it a turret. I'm not quite sure what it was. But inside it, there was a control block. There's some revolving thing that he just lay on and went, ah, <laughs> maniacal. <laughs> I am all powerful. It was crazy. And as he nursed this thing as he coveted this module nodule thing it began to rise up the turret at the top it emerged and it went up a little too far it, he overshot basically and it fell off leaving him on the top of the turret what looked like a chimney actually but it was very lonely up there yeah okay you're successful yeah, okay. You appear on Russian television. Yeah, you have a big audience on Fox. But you're alone. People think you're a wacko. You've sold your soul simply to get viewers. Now, I've seen him being interviewed, Tucker Carlson, and he's very reasonable when you listen to him. If you listen to a long-form interview with him, he's very reasonable, very nice, very agreeable and accessible. And uh, you would think, there's a rational guy. But for some reason, give him a TV show, and he seems to go right off the rails. He says, I'm not on the side of Russia. Are you crazy? I was just joking. <laughs> no, I don't think you were just joking. But uh, there comes a point where he's taken this as far as it will go. And it's to be hoped that he hasn't done so much damage by that point, to a lot of very, very gullible minds, that uh, it becomes irreversible. Also, I took a look at Reverend Raphael Warnock, the Baptist minister who became the junior senator for Georgia last year. He's up for re-election in the midterms, and uh, the favourite on the Republican side to beat him so far is Herschel Walker, the ex-football player. Raphael Warnock has got a huge campaign war chest. He raised nine point something million in the last three months alone. So uh, he is on course to be re-elected. But I thought I'd take a look and see how he might fare. And obviously he is feeling pretty confident because when I went into the energy, he was shimmying. There was a sort of... I'm a senator, I'm going to remain a senator. It's all very, very easy. He just shimmied that way and then shimmied this way. 
It's, it's just confident. Feels as if he's done a good job and voters are on his side. That's not to say that his run won't be without challenges. There was an initial challenge and he covered that. He's just a very competent, capable, intelligent guy. But then he could see ahead big storm clouds. I think the midterms are going to be stormy. I think the rest of this year may very well be stormy, politically speaking, because a lot of factions are vying for power in November. But through the clouds, there was a staircase up. And no matter what went on around him, no matter how much tumult or how much argument, counter-argument, people blasting each other from different sides, no matter what went on, this staircase, if he just ploughed on through, got him to where he needed to go. There didn't seem to be anything that spilled over from the sides, from the storm, from the tumult, to block his path. All he had to do was keep on climbing. Now, it was not going to be easy. Staircases of any kind represent challenges. The elections for you, I mean, they're always challenging. But if he just kept on going, he reached the top and... I don't know about winning and losing, but he seemed to be in a very, very advantageous position based on today's energy. But really, the only way to know is by looking at Herschel Walker as well and putting the two together. Now, Herschel Walker is not the official Republican nominee yet, but he's one of those conspiracy theory guys. He backs Trump all the way. He promoted the big lie. Trump has endorsed him. So has Mitch McConnell. So he does seem to be the favorite to take on Warnock in the midterms. So I put the two together to see what happened. Raphael Warnock on the left, Herschel Walker on the right. And what was really interesting about this was that in these pictures too, Raphael Warnock was incredibly easy, loosey-goosey, singing at Herschel Walker, almost taunting him with song, like crooning, you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose, I'm the winner, you know, that kind of thing. It was just as they walked along together, the interaction between them was almost cartoonishly weird, with Herschel Walker being incredibly serious marching ahead, fighting, wanting to win, score a victory. Now, of course, he's got a lot to overcome. He's got mental issues. He had accusations against him of domestic violence. He's also got that whole big lie thing as well, which could become an anchor around his feet once uh, the January the 6th committee reports. And so there's a lot going on with him, and he has a lot to fight for. But just ahead, there was a wall. And in the wall, there was a crack that was only one person wide. So only one of them could get through at a time. But they didn't accept that. Maybe this is the primaries later this year, but they couldn't accept that. And they both tried to squeeze through at the same time. It was a real tussle. And when they were done, they lay on the ground like, we made it. Yeah, we're the guys. Look at us. Their relationship improved somewhat. They just lay on the ground chatting. But then Warnock stands up and goes, hey, dude, we've got a race to run. Come on, we've got to go. Herschel Walker stands up and instead of just walking alongside Warnock, he gets his elbow and he jabs him in the side and knocks him right off his feet. And off he marches, leaving Warnock behind. In the previous pictures for Herschel Walker, he didn't get very far. After a while, his whole campaign folded. But here, he seemed to be marching ahead, leaving Warnock in the distance. But here's the thing about the Herschel campaign. It goes up a hill, so it's challenging. And then there's a steep cliff down and he goes right over it and falls. And all these people gather around him, like the press or whatever. And he's lying on the ground going, oh, oh, oh that hurt. Meanwhile, Raphael Warnock is just strolling by, watching the commotion and thinking, you know, sometimes it just pays to take it easy, to croon, to shimmy. You don't have to be that cocky and serious and fight all the time. That's based on today. Things can change, of course. And finally, since we're on this kind of topic, I thought I would look once again at U.S. democracy. 
Because if you watch the media, and I don't really, I, luckily I don't watch TV or in newspapers and whatever, but if you do, clearly you're very, very worried about the state of US democracy. Now, things are moving ahead, of course. Uh, the January 6th committee has subpoenaed a bunch of those fake electors who were trying to throw the election for Trump. So that's underway. Subpoenas have been issued for other people as well. The Oath Keepers are in jail <laughs> pending trial. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on and things are on course. But it seems like a race against the clock because of the midterms. Can the Democrats get this sorted out before the midterms, before the Republicans possibly, we're not saying for sure, but possibly sweep in and undermine the investigation? In the previous pictures, if you remember, for US democracy, it showed a big cloud full of legs. And it was made up of people who were challenging the democratic norms, not just the Oath Keepers, not just the January the 6th people, but various militias around the country. There's even a rumour right now that some of the right-wing militias are threatening to take down the power grid on the East and West Coasts. But it did seem like these forces were at play trying to stage another coup in Congress, but this time from the inside. So get elected and it would be impossible to get Democrats elected ever again because you would just change the system once you were in. That's what it felt like. So a lot of people were worried by that. A lot of people said, well, that's incredibly depressing because I said, once they're in, once they breach the wall, they're in and it'll be very hard to get rid of them. So, because so many people were left miserable by that, I thought I'd take a look again. <laughs> so, you can sleep easily this time. And when I found democracy, there it was with a big arrow over it, instead of walking along an open plain as if everything was going to be simple and straightforward, it was digging itself a hole. I can imagine that that actually is the way it is. You know, democracy seems to be stuck with a divided Senate and so much division within society, so many people believing the big lie and so on, it does seem like democracy has run into a brick wall. And it was digging itself a hole. What's more, up came the black cloud again, rolling in a storm of rain. Luckily, and this was the really interesting part of these pictures, because democracy was in its little hole that it had dug. It wasn't subjected to the storm quite so much. The severity was averted. Maybe the January the 6th committee report solves a lot of problems and opens people's eyes to what's really going on so that when the tumult arrives, the Steve Bannon promoted upsets or whatever, when those go by, democracy still stands. That's possible because the storm went over, democracy peers out of its hole and goes, oh, that's it. Oh, right. Oh, good. It's over. Not quite. Because after a heavy storm, the field that there was beyond the hole was all mushy, soggy, full of puddles. So whatever the storm had done, whatever damage it had wrought would take time to dry out. But then there was another challenge, a climb up. That had to be overcome as well. But it took it out of the mud. That's a good thing. Then there was a narrow squeeze through two hills. These are all symbols within the pictures of introspective analysis of how are we going to change? How are we going to overcome what has just happened? It does seem like this is all part of this emergent process of democracy reinventing itself. In fact, after the narrow squeeze, democracy made a left, which is always like something new, some new direction. So it seemed like this year, maybe this year and a half, up to the elections, after the elections, was a period of sorting out. It would be like going through your basement and, and chucking out all the stuff that you no longer need. Now nah, that's uh, attracting mice. Oh, that's horrible. Oh, that's old. We don't need that anymore. So that everything could be revised and looked at afresh 
and what's unnecessary disposed of in favor of doing things the right way in future. You know, it's natural for people to get caught up in consternation, but it doesn't really help. Worrying doesn't help. There was a poem I read a long time ago by Mary Oliver. Have you heard of her? She's a very, very esteemed poet. She began in the 1960s. And it was called I Worried, this poem. And it went, I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it. And I, I'm well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading? Or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. Brilliant, Mary Oliver. That's what we forget to do sometimes. We forget to sing. And, you know, none of that undermines how important this period is to American democracy, to the evolution of the country. But sometimes we forget to sing. You know what I started doing? Instead of feeling frustration and irritation at things which I used to do a lot, I now look at whatever happens and go, wow, I'm breathing. I'm alive to experience this thing. It may not be positive. It may not be helpful. It may be a source of consternation, but I'm alive to experience this thing, whatever it is. In my masterpiece book, I featured the planet Saturn. You know, it's all about achieving peace in your life and achieving peace in the world and stop fighting over bits of rock and claiming them as your own or whatever. But there's a picture of Saturn showing the Earth as a pinprick across the universe in the distance. To illustrate perspective, no matter how terrible things seem, no matter how worrying they are, no matter who's fighting who or blaming who, in the end, none of it matters. In infinity, in eternity, it's minuscule. We have to gain some perspective. What was that line from the best exotic marigold hotel? Everything will be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, it's not the end. I love that. Alrighty, so uh, thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it, as always. Don't forget to subscribe if you would. That would really help me. Uh, like, share, similarly, ditto. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter if you like. That would be great too. We have lots of fun things over there. All right, otherwise, I will see you next time, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.